Hi, good afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know it's a couple minutes before three, but um, so this lecture is uh, about an hour or so. We're probably not going to get through the whole thing, but I'm going to do as much as I can. Um, the, this is the first in a, a series of two lectures on MRI of the knee. I'm going to concentrate on the first one on meniscal imaging and on the second one on uh, ligamentous uh, uh, injuries, patterns of injury. I do want to caution everyone. Um, there's a lot of information in both these lectures. There's a lot of anatomy. Every, all the slides are in on the CD-ROM, so I'd encourage you just to kind of pay attention and try to get the, the general gestalt right now, and, um, and then you can go back and look at the CD-ROM later. But uh, these, uh, both my lectures uh, are very uh, anatomy heavy, so um, hopefully that will be agreeable to everyone here. But uh, let's get started. So the menisci of the knee function to increase joint surface area and joint congruency, and they transmit a significant amount of the load that's applied across the knee. The lateral meniscus transmits more of the load across the knee than the medial meniscus, and the posterior horns transmit more of that load than the anterior horns, and that's just because the posterior horns are bigger and the lateral meniscus covers more of the surface area of the lateral tube plateau than on the medial side. The menisci also function to distribute load across the tibial plateau and also function as secondary shock absorbers in the knee. If you take out one of the menisci, you decrease the ability of the knee to absorb uh, shock by a significant amount. The uh, secondary functions are also to reduce stress and they function as secondary stabilizers of the knee. They also may uh, play some role or do play some role in limiting flexion, the extremes of flexion and extension of the knee. Now one point I'm going to keep coming back to over and over is this, uh, the next point, which is the lateral meniscus is much more mobile than the medial meniscus is. That is uh, one reason or a significant reason that it's thought that there are fewer lateral meniscal tears than medial meniscal tears. Here you can see a nice gross specimen of a menisca, of a menisca, uh, two menisci medial and lateral. A lot of these uh, gross images are from primal images, uh, David Stoller's CD. Um, so anyway, let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of the menisci. They're composed of fibrocartilage. The lateral meniscus is circular and it's approximately equal in size throughout its course. So both anteriorly and posteriorly the lateral meniscus um, is about uh, equal, so the anterior and posterior horns are about the same size. The medial meniscus, on the other hand, is semicircular. The anterior horn of the medial meniscus is significantly smaller than the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. The lateral meniscus also covers more of the tibial plateau than the medial meniscus, as I mentioned before. So uh, the uh, first of multiple um, ligaments we're going to talk about that are intimately associated with the menisci is uh, one of the easier ones, the anterior transverse meniscal ligament. You see it um, illustrated here. This connects the apex of the anterior horn of the medial meniscus with the anterior convex portion of the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. It passes through hoppus fat and is present in about two-thirds of the population. Uh, the function, a little unclear, but most people think that it resists some posterior mo movement of the anterior horn of the medial meniscus during knee flexion. Uh, on your axial images, sometimes you may see the anterior transverse meniscal ligament. We see it there. And you see it quite often on your sagittal images. Here I've got it uh, shown on sequential uh, cuts for you. It's important to remember, excuse me, that this may simulate a meniscal tear. You look here at the anterior horn of the meniscus, you say, well, it looks like there's uh, intermediate signal here separating the meniscus into two pieces. If you follow the structure, though, on sequential images, you'll see that that's just the anterior horn, uh, anterior transverse meniscal ligament. Here again, in this case, it really simulates a tear. So this is a, a, um, something to really be aware of. Um, but if you follow again that structure, you can see it continues into hoppus fat, and that's just the transverse meniscal ligament. You may sometimes see this on plain film as well. This is a case one of our fellows called an intraarticular body a couple of years ago, uh, and I thought it was a nice example of the way the ligament looks on plain film. You're seeing down the barrel of the ligament, and uh, it can be mistaken for a body. The lateral meniscus, as I mentioned before, has a much looser attachment to the joint capsule than does the medial meniscus. Uh, posteriorly, the popliteus tendon, which I've outlined here in blue on this gross specimen, uh, the po uh, popliteus tendon passes between the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus and the capsule. And um, sorry, this is posterior back here. This is anterior. Um, and it's important to know that because the popliteus tendon, as it passes by the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, may mimic a tear. The lateral meniscus is attached to the joint capsule around the popliteus by what are known as the superior and inferior popliteal meniscal fascicles or struts. Um, 
And because of this relatively loose attachment to the capsule, the lateral meniscus is much more mobile than the medial meniscus. This is a schematic drawing of what the struts look like and what you're going to want to look for on your sagittal MR images. So here are the struts I've outlined uh, with the yellow arrows. The blue is the popliteus tendon. The red, of course, is the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And then the white posteriorly is the joint capsule. This is what they look like on MR images. Here's the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Here I think you can probably see them better on the fluid sensitive sequence. This is the superior. The inferior strut is not quite so well seen. And this is the popliteus tendon passing, again, posterior to the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Note that uh, note the relatively loose attachment there. You can see that it looks relatively loose. Here again, we see the intimate relationship between the popliteus tendon and the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Here the meniscal struts or fascicles are nicely illustrated. Here's an example of a tear of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. We have a complex tear. And note that the struts of the uh, lateral meniscus are also disrupted. Just because you, um, <clears throat> you don't always have a tear of the struts when you do have a, um, a posterior horn lateral meniscal tear, but you also may have tears of the struts without uh, a tear of the meniscus. As in this case, you can see that there's complete disruption of the struts but the meniscus is intact. You see all this fluid in here. We're missing our struts, though. And that's certainly increasing the uh, mobility of the lateral meniscus even above its baseline. The medial meniscus, as I've said, has a tighter attachment to the capsule than the lateral meniscus. It's firmly attached to the deep portion of the medial collateral ligament. And I'll have a lot more to say about that in the second hour. Um, the deep portion of the MCL, though, is known as the, uh, the, known as the meniscofemoral and meniscotibial uh, extensions of the MCL or ligaments. The meniscotibial portion is also known as the coronary ligament. But what's important to remember is this very tight attachment. So here's a schematic diagram demonstrating the uh, medial meniscus here, body of the medial meniscus. The white illustrates, the, the structures in white are the uh, meniscofemoral and meniscotibial portions of the deep layer of the MCL. In green here, this is what most people think of as the MCL proper. Um, and this is actually the super, what's really the superficial layer of the MCL or layer two. In between, there is a bursa, uh, a potential uh, bursa, the MCL bursa, as well as some fat, which I've uh, uh, illustrated there. But the coronary ligament, um, which we're going to come back to again later uh, when we talk about reverse Sagan fractures, um, that is uh, a portion of the deep layer of the MCL. All these structures have a very tight attachment to the uh, medial meniscus. The meniscofemoral ligaments extend from the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus to the inner portion of the medial femoral condyle. There's a little bit of a simplification. There are a few variants, uh, one variant, uh, but uh, for the most part, the ones that uh, most of us are going to see in daily practice are these. They're closely associated with the PCL, and together with the PCL, the form, they form the PCL complex. I think everyone knows the anterior ligament is known as the ligament of Humphrey, and the posterior ligament is known as the ligament of Risberg. Uh, about um, a third of the population has either one or the other, and about a third of the population has neither. The importance, again, of knowing these is that these ligaments may simulate a tear of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, or a PCL tear. Okay, so here's a schematic diagram demonstrating one of the ligaments. This is the ligament of Risberg. We're looking posteriorly at the knee. Here we see the posterior cruciate ligament, and this is one of the uh, meniscofemoral ligaments, the posterior one, the ligament of Risberg. Note the very intimate association this ligament has with the posterior cruciate ligament. This is a gross uh, picture, and this is showing you the anterior ligament, the ligament of Humphrey. Here we're seeing the two bands of the posterior cruciate ligament, and anterior to that is the um, ligament of Humphrey. We'll come back and talk more about the PCL later. On your sagittal images, uh, what you want to look for are these structures located anterior and posterior to the PCL here, pictured in yellow, the ACL in white, Humphrey anterior, and Risberg posteriorly. They go in alphabetical order. Here's an example of uh, the ligament of Humphrey. On coronal images, you can also see these ligaments. <clears throat> they, again, extend from the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus to the inner portion of the medial femoral condyle. On uh, coronal MR images here, we see the ligament extending from the, uh, the posterior uh, horn of the lateral meniscus, again, to the uh, medial femoral condyle. We can see it quite nicely. Here, um, they, you can see the, how they can simulate a meniscal tear. 
This is the uh, posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Here we have a structure. It looks like there's some linear abnormal signal there. If you follow that structure, keep following it, you see that it's the ligament of Risberg. So important to be aware of these structures. Again, a potential pitfall when evaluating um, uh, knees for uh, meniscal injury. I want to talk about, about the root ligaments. How many people know or are familiar with the uh, root ligaments of the menisci? Raise your hand. It's just actually kind of curious how many people evaluate those on it. Okay. Um, so the root ligaments have uh, gained more attention recently. There are four root ligaments of the menisci, including an anterior and posterior root ligament for each meniscus. The most important one, and the one that you should always check on every MR, is the posterior root ligament of the medial meniscus. This is by far and away the most important of the root ligaments. It, the posterior, the uh, root ligament of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus should be seen at the level where you see the PCL attachment or one image anterior on your coronal images. <clears throat> Schematically, this is what the uh, root ligaments uh, are. They don't look any different in signal intensity than the remainder of the meniscus, but the root ligaments are the central extensions or central attachments of the uh, menisci. Schematically, what, you're going to, what you want to look for is the central extension of meniscal tissue. Now, I've shown it in yellow here. It's a different color than the uh, remainder of the meniscus. You're not going to have that luxury on MR. It's going to look the same uh, signal intensity. But what you want to look for is this central kind of extension. Note that I'm looking on the image where I see the attachment of the PCL onto the tibia. Here is what we are going to see on your MR images. That's the central extension of the uh, meniscus. That's the root ligament. Tears of the root ligaments are highly associated with meniscal contusion and with meniscal extrusion. Um, there's also a significant association between sonk or sonk type lesions um, and uh, tears of the root ligament. So if you see what looks like a sonk lesion, uh, and by that I mean what most people now are considering subchondral insufficiency fractures of the femoral condyle, usually of the weight-bearing surface of the medial femoral condyle, if you see what looks like one of those sonk type lesions, you need to look closely at the posterior root ligament of the medial meniscus. If you see what looks like the uh, root ligament more than one image anterior to the PCL, then you should uh, consider that you have a bucket handle tear of the meniscus. Okay. A couple of words about meniscal vascularity. This is important because the, uh, the orthopedic surgeon wants to know what portion of the meniscus is involved with the tear uh, to guide him in his therapy, whether it can be um, repaired or needs to be resected. Remember that the majority of the menisci in adults is avascular. Um, and tears in the red zone or the vascular zone are the uh, tears that have the best chance to heal. Tears in the white zone lack the ability to heal. You notice on you know, the schematic, the red zone only accounts for a small, uh, small percentage of the entire um, area or volume of the meniscus on both sides. So uh, tears which have the, p the possibility of healing, really only the small, the, only the uh, peripheral uh, tears which have the possibility of healing. There is what uh, some people call a pink zone, which is a zone of borderline vascularity. This is a, uh, I think, a nice um, slide showing um, a, an injection into the uh, perimeniscal capillary plexus, showing the meniscal vascularity. And if you look uh, here, this is the large portion of the meniscus, which is avascular. Here's the pink zone, the borderline vascularity area. This is all that you really have that's the red zone, that's the vascular portion of the meniscus. Then the rest of that are this, the perimeniscal uh, capsular vessels. Um, so really a small proportion of the meniscus that's vascular. Normal MR appearance, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. I think everyone in this room probably knows what the menisci should look like. There should be a low signal intensity triangle with a sharp tip on both the coronal and the sagittal images. You know about the, the, uh, the size of the menisci, what they should be, look like, the different horns relative to one another after uh, kind of reviewing the, that anatomy, I hope. Uh, the triangles should unite centrally and produce a bow tie appearance on the sagittal images. And you should normally see two consecutive bow ties on your sagittal images. <clears throat> Coronal images again here we see this nice black triangle, sharp tips on both sides. What are the criteria we use for diagnosing meniscal tears? Well, there's several. One is altered signal intensity in the meniscus, and two is altered morphology. That altered morphology can be either be an alteration of meniscal size or meniscal shape. Remember that the medial meniscus is more commonly involved with tears than is the lateral meniscus. <clears throat> the most common sites of meniscal tears are the posterior horn of the medial meniscus and the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. <clears throat>
intermeniscal signal. There's several different grading systems. This is the most simplified grading system. <clears throat> not really important. I don't ever use the grading uh, system in my reports. I just say whether or not there is a tear. Uh, if you see linear abnormal signal in the meniscus that does not extend to an articular surface, that is not a tear. That is intersubstance degeneration. Now, there is a very small percentage of patients who have this signal who will have an underlying tear, but it's a very small percentage. It's the same with type 1 signal, the globular increase signal. Remember that this is not an articular surface of the meniscus. This and this. Those are the articular surfaces. If the, this signal extends back there, that does not count as a tear. The abnormal signal must extend to an articular surface, either the inferior or the superior articular surface. Kind of skipped over the type 1 signal, but that's just globular increased intrasubstance signal, which is again associated with intrameniscal degeneration. Both types 1 and type 2 signal are consistent, most consistent with intrameniscal degeneration. Um, you may see increasing grade 1 and grade 2 signal in patients uh, as they get older. Uh, this abnormal signal is also most common in the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. Uh, that's where you, uh, you're most likely to see it. There is some thought that the abnormal intrameniscal degeneration may predispose to a tear, but that's not uh, been in, uh, shown to entirely to be the case. So as I said, the abnormal signal should unequivocally extend to an articular surface. Now, what if you see this grade 3 signal? And by grade 3, I mean the signal that goes to an articular surface on a single image only. If you see it on the lateral side, a single image, by single image, I mean a single sagittal image or a single coronal image. If you see it on the lateral side, you have about a 30 percent positive predictive value that that's going to be a lateral meniscal tear. So if you see that signal on one image <clears throat> on the lateral side, you still have a 70 percent chance that, that there's not an underlying tear on that side. On the medial side, uh, a little bit uh, greater chance if you see it on a, on a single image, but only about a 55 percent chance. If you see it on more than one image, so if you see it on one sagittal, one coronal, two sagittal, whatever, then you have a greater than 90 percent positive predictive value for a meniscal tear. Okay. What are the exceptions to this? What other things may you look for to suggest that there is a tear um, even if the signal doesn't go to a surface? Well, one exception is the meniscus within a meniscus appearance. This appearance, which I've illustrated here, is highly suggestive of a tear. This corresponds to extensive intrameniscal degeneration and cavitation in the meniscus and is thought to represent a tear. Meniscal contusions uh, may also look like this, so you have to be a little bit careful. If I see this, I do suggest that there is likely an underlying tear or at least underlying cavitation in the meniscus. Also, the presence of a parameniscal cyst, even in the absence of any abnormal signal in the meniscus, is highly suggestive of a tear. Um, so if you do see a parameniscal cyst, even if the meniscus looks normal, please suggest that there is an underlying meniscal tear. In addition, extensive intermediate signal in a discoid meniscus is highly suggestive of cavitation in the meniscus and should, uh, um, should be suggested that there is an underlying tear. So if you see a discoid meniscus has a lot of uh, abnormal signal in it, that there's probably an underlying tear. Morphologic abnormalities. We've talked about signal abnormalities to define meniscal tear, but what about morphology? Well, if there's blunting or poor definition over the free edge of the meniscus, that is very suggestive of a meniscal tear. Also, abnormal size. If the posterior horn of the medial the, the posterior horn of the medial meniscus is normally larger than the anterior horn, if the posterior horn looks smaller or equal in size to the anterior horn on the medial side, then you need to suspect that you're dealing with a form of a meniscal tear and look more closely. The notch sign refers to abnormal contour of the meniscus, especially as, if it's associated with abnormal internal signal intensity, but it's not always uh, associated with that in signal intensity and may still represent a tear. And I'm going to show you examples of all of these. And then uh, the normal flounce, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but I'll show you what that is. <clears throat> so this is a pretty straightforward example. This is uh, blunting of both the anterior and posterior horns of the meniscus here, again, compatible with radial tears of the meniscus. This is the notch sign. Here it looks like someone took like an ice cream uh, scooper and cut out a piece of the inferior surface of the meniscus. That is compatible with a, uh, a meniscal tear. It's a small meniscal tear. It may not uh, need surgery, but it just depends on the patient's, uh, the patient's symptomatology. This is what's known as a meniscal flounce. 
Um, a meniscal flange is just a, a, a kind of a serpentine uh, course that the meniscus may take. Meniscal flounces may or may not be associated with meniscal tears. You don't always, um, there doesn't always have to be an underlying tear. So a flounce may be seen in a normal, normal meniscus. This was a normal meniscus. <clears throat> this was a patient who had a meniscal tear. Here you can obviously see that. And then you can see the serpentine course that the, the meniscus takes. Um, this is another uh, meniscal flounce, but here uh, associated with a meniscal tear. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the types and the etiology of meniscal tears. <clears throat> meniscal tears come in several different uh, varieties. They come in the longitudinal variety and in the radial variety kind of overall. The longitudinal variety can be broken down into vertical tears, as I have pictured here, horizontal tears, which are also known as cleavage tears and are most commonly degenerative, and then oblique tears. So here we see just a very classic appearance of a typical vertical longitudinal tear of the meniscus. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the etiology. Meniscal tears begin as a radial crack in the meniscus. Uh, the uh, collagen fibers that are in a meniscus that are pictured here are uh, circumferentially arranged, uh, and these are all the collagen fibers, and you can see they kind of go around in this circumferential orientation. <clears throat> a tear, uh, the uh, radial crack will occur in the, in the substance of the meniscus, but it's very difficult for that force or that tear to propagate perpendicular or against the circumferential arrangement of the collagen fibers. Therefore, the tears tend to want to propagate in a longitudinal direction in parallel with these circumferentially arranged collagen fibers. All right, how do they begin? So traumatic tears occur when the load that's applied to the meniscus exceeds the ability of the meniscus to deform. Degenerative tears occur when normal stresses are applied to a degenerated meniscus. This is what typical appearance of a traumatic tear. Traumatic tears tend to be vertical. <clears throat> As you can see here, this is a nice peripheral vertical tear here. And here, this is in the red zone of the meniscus, uh, at least close to the red zone, and potentially could be repaired. So you need to report uh, the location of this tear uh, and note that it is in the region of the red zone. But traumatic tears tend to be uh, vertical tears. I said traumatic, usually vertical usually propagate in a longitudinal direction, but occasionally may propagate in a transverse direction. <clears throat> that is uh, perpendicular to those circumferentially arranged collagen fibers. They often involve the free edge of the meniscus. They tend to occur in young patients and are usually related to a single traumatic episode. So here we have actually a double vertical tear of the posterior horn of the meniscus here. Uh, double vertical tears, when you see those, they're often associated with ACL injury. They're called ramp lesions. <clears throat> so, how do these tears occur? Remember, again, I said that collagen fibers are arranged in this direction, so there is an axial force is applied, there's a radial crack, and then the meniscus is split. It's split into inner and outer portions. That's what a vertical longitudinal tear is. The meniscus is split into inner and outer portions. The tear has a 60 to 90 degree orientation. They're three times more common medially than they are laterally, and they can be peripheral or central, as in this case. If they are large, the inner fragment may be displaced centrally. When that inner fragment is displaced centrally, that's what's known as a bucket handle tear. <clears throat> the peripheral vertical tears of the posterior horn of either meniscus have a relatively high likelihood of healing. Again, that's because they are in the, they, they are in the, uh, in the uh, red zone of the meniscus. So schematically here we have a small vertical longitudinal tear, meniscus divided into inner and outer portions. That tear can extend further anteriorly and posteriorly. You have a very large tear, certainly a surgical tear in this case. If that inner portion flips to the inside, <clears throat> you have what's known as a bucket handle tear. This is the, the handle, this is the bucket, and this is that piece of meniscus which is flipped inside into the intercondylar notch. Now sometimes this portion may break as well. If that breaks, the, the attached portion of the meniscus may flip anteriorly or, or posteriorly, either way. This is what's known as a broken bucket handle tear. I'm going to show you an example. So, <clears throat> Typical vertical longitudinal tear, meniscus divided into inner and outer portions. Bucket handle tears, as I showed you, the inner portion is displaced centrally, commonly seen in young patients, and the patients usually present with a history of locking. 
They're much more common medially than they are laterally. When they occur on the medial side, you may see what's known as the double PCL sign. You'll see two fragments of tissue, one of which is the PCL and one of which is the bucket handle from the uh, meniscus, <clears throat> or the double ACL sign when they occur on the lateral side. If the posterior horn of either meniscus is smaller than the anterior horn on either side, that finding is very suggestive that you're dealing with a bucket handle tear because that means a piece of the posterior horn is no longer where it should be and is flipped somewhere else. Okay, nice example here, the double PCL sign. This is the normal posterior cruciate ligament. We can see its origin and its insertion here. Adjacent to that, we see the uh, flipped fragment from the medial meniscus lying adjacent to it, the double PCL sign. <clears throat> here we can see why we see that on the sagittal PCL bucket handle fragment. Lateral side, we get the double ACL sign. Here we have the uh, normal ACL, normal ACL, and here we have something uh, lying parallel to the ACL. This is a fragment from the lateral meniscus. Flip menisci are just a variation on bucket handle tears. They tend to occur on the lateral side because the lateral meniscus is more mobile, excuse me, than the, uh, than the medial meniscus, as I mentioned. The posterior fragment is often flipped anteriorly and may lie on top of the anterior horn while attaching, while remaining attached centrally. Again, that broken bucket handle type of tear, as I've said. If you see, uh, don't see any posterior horn menis of uh, the meniscus or too much anterior meniscal tissue, then you need to think about a flipped meniscus. Sometimes the anterior horn may flip posteriorly, as we see in this case. Here we see not enough anterior meniscal tissue. This may be a little bit of the anterior horn or a little bit of the uh, anterior transverse meniscal ligament, but we have all this posterior meniscal tissue, way too much menisci posteriorly, not enough anteriorly, the anterior horn has flipped posteriorly. <clears throat> Here we have not enough posterior meniscal tissue, we have two anterior horns. I can't tell you which of these is the, the uh, actual, the, the true anterior horn on this cut because I don't have the other images, but we've got one is the anterior horn and the other one is the posterior horn which is flipped anteriorly, so a flipped meniscus. <clears throat> this case, uh, it's kind of neat, I think, um, not because it's not really a, a, so much a flipped meniscus. We have the anterior horn. We don't have the normal looking posterior <clears throat> meniscus here, and we have all this balled up tissue. This is the posterior horn that's torn and, tor and kind of twisted up on itself. So just another variant on the flipped meniscus. Okay, so those are the typical traumatic tears that we're going to see. Now, the degenerative tears, I don't know about uh, everyone's practice here, but we probably see a lot more degenerative tears, unfortunately, than the, um, the uh, traumatic tears. These tears are usually horizontal, or also known as cleavage tears. They're most commonly seen in the posterior horn of the meniscus. They, attend, they tend to occur in older patients, and the patients often have associated osteoarthritis. So I said, they're also, uh, they're also known as cleavage tears. They're usually horizontal in, in orientation or slightly oblique. They may or may not violate the meniscal apex, but they usually come, they often come down to either the superior or the inferior articular surface. The men parameniscal cysts are commonly associated with this type of tear. They're much less uh, highly associated with uh, traumatic tears of the menisci. These tears, again, we have chronic repetitive force now applied to a degenerated meniscus. There's a radial crack, and then the meniscus is split into uh, lower and upper portions. Here again we see a complex tear but it's predominantly horizontal in orientation. Here we can see we've got the Oreo cookie appearance of the menisci uh, of the meniscus and we have uh, the filling here in the center representing the tear and here we can see it touching several articular surfaces. And again here the same appearance of meniscus split into upper and lower portions. Again remember that uh, degenerative tears are commonly associated with parameniscal cyst. You can see the parameniscal cyst is quite extensive. It's gone all the way down here. Uh, so a typical appearance of a degenerative tear associated parameniscal cyst. Um, oblique tears have a, both a horizontal and vertical orientation. They're usually between 60 and 90 degrees in orientation. Uh, I'm sorry, 30 and 60 degrees. They, often, they tend to violate the inferior articular surface. Okay. Radial tears, what are these? Radial tears are a variant of a vertical tear involving the free edge of the meniscus. They're often limited to the inner margin of the meniscus, and they're most commonly seen in the middle third of the lateral meniscus. 
Um, radial tears are relatively uncommon, and the reason is, again, going back to that anatomy that I showed you before, is that circumferential arrangement of the collagen fibers. It's very difficult for the force to propagate in perpendicular to the, those uh, circumferentially arranged collagen fibers. So, par so radial tears only make up a small percentage of meniscal tears overall. Sometimes they take a curved course, and those are what, that's what's known as parrot beak tears. So here we see schematically what a radial tear will look like. <clears throat> You're just going to see some blunting of the free edge. You may see a linear line going through the bow tie on your, uh, on your images, depending on uh, this would actually a coronal image through here it would look like this, and your sagittal image would look like that. Radial tears, though, are important because they do disrupt those longitudinally oriented collagen fibers. So it either takes a lot of energy, high energy injury, or a weakening of the meniscus to produce a radial tear. <clears throat> when the meniscus is torn uh, in a radial fashion, it is unable to resist hoop stress because those collagen fibers are interrupted. They only account for a small percentage of, of uh, tears, but they're important to recognize because they really compromise the ability of the men meniscus to absorb shock and to function. Full thickness radial tears can be easily missed because the sign of a full thickness radial tear is an absent meniscus. You're not going to have any meniscal tissue, and, um, and it's so you, it's e they're easy to walk by. What you want to look for is truncation of the meniscal triangle, as we see here, abnormal morphology, basically blunting of the meniscal tip, um, fluid uh, going into the tear, or the gray or the absent meniscus sign, and I'll show you some examples of these. <clears throat> So here we see this. Um, you can see if you're cutting through this tear on a, on a uh, sagittal image, all you're going to see is an absent meniscus. There's no meniscal tissue in here. Here we see fluid, though, extending into the, the posterior horn of the meniscus here. <clears throat> this is a radial tear. This is cut right through those collagen fibers in the meniscus and has significantly weakened the meniscus. Again, as I said, the meniscal tears, these uh, radial tears may take a curved course. When they take a curved course, they're referred to as parrot beak tears. And when you follow them on sequential images, the tears will appear to move in location from one slice to the next because they are taking a curved course and they won't stay in the same um, anatomic spot in the meniscus from one image to the next. This is, um, if you look at the anterior horn here, you can see what looks like a, uh, a radial tear, there's blunting of the meniscus, there's no meniscal tissue in here. <clears throat> here we have this blunting here, and when we look on the axial image, we can see how the, the, uh, the tear has taken sort of a curved course, and that's what a parrot beak tear looks like. Not so important to, uh, to necessarily uh, know that, but at least to recognize that this is a form of a radial tear. That's important. Complex tears, as most people know, are tears demonstrating more than one plane of orientation. <laughs> So here again, we've got multiple planes of orientation, complex tear. Complex tears are unstable. Okay, we talked about the posterior, about the root ligaments of the menisci, and as I said, um, these are important because uh, you want to look for tears in this location. They have multiple associations. Meniscal root tears most commonly occur in the posterior root ligament of the medial meniscus. They tend to be more common in women, especially women who are overweight. Uh, if you see extrusion of the body of the medial meniscus, that finding is highly suggestive that you're dealing with a tear of the root ligament. So you want to look for uh, meniscal extrusion. There are other things that can cause meniscal extrusion, such as osteophytes, large joint effusions, but if you see extrusion of the meniscus, you really need to inspect the posterior root ligament very closely. As I mentioned before, there's a high association between uh, um, tears of the posterior root ligaments and uh, sonk like lesions. What's that? Sonk stands for, uh, spon it's an old term, it, spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee. Sometimes they put a C here, spontaneous osteonecrosis of the medial femoral condyle. These are lesions that occur along the weight bearing surface of the medial femoral condyle in the subchondral bone. They produce a lot of edema. If you look very closely, you can often see a subchondral fracture line. Um, patients usually can tell you right when the pain started. They usually occur relatively suddenly, They're going for a long time. Um, these lesions were thought to be osteonecrosis. Um, it's now thought uh, that these actually represent subchondral insufficiency fractures. They usually occur in older uh, women who are a little overweight, have a lot of degenerative disease, tend to be osteopenic, or osteoporotic, uh, and so they're actually thought to be subchondral insufficiency fractures, not osteonecrosis. They're relatively common. Uh, 
So meniscal root tears, highly associated, as I said, with these sunk lesions. Uh, if you don't see medial meniscal tissue, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, if you don't see meniscal tissue uh, medial to the PCL, that finding is highly suggestive of a radial tear at the root attachment of the posterior root ligament. These tears are almost always radial tears. Um, this is what uh, you will or won't see. So you want to look where, look um, over to find the posterior uh, cruciate ligament, and you should see meniscal tissue there. If you're not seeing it, you can see in this ghost of a meniscus here. That is um, what the tears look like. They're easy to walk by if you're not familiar with where they are and where to look for them. And again, the peripheral portion of the involved meniscus, such as the body, may be extruded. This is what they look like. You see how, as I showed you before, what the normal root ligament should look like? There's no black meniscal tissue in there. This is all gray. This is a tear of the posterior root ligament here on the lateral side. Note the normal posterior root ligament on the medial side here, abnormal and normal. Again, here we see the PCL. There's no meniscal tissue back here, or maybe just a little fragment. This is a tear of the posterior root ligament. Same patient. Meniscus comes over, oops, it stops. The meniscal tissue should continue down here, continue to insert. This is what they look like, okay? You should be aware, be, uh, need to really inspect that area on every case. This is where you should see some more meniscal tissue going here centrally. <clears throat> Here's another example here. Um, again, posterior root ligament in this region, it's torn. Here we see fluid extending into that area. Extrusion of the meniscus, as I said, um, may occur uh, as a result of these tears of the posterior root ligaments. If you see extension of meniscal tissue more than three millimeters beyond the tibial plateau, that finding is abnormal. Um, our osteophytes and articular cartilage loss, as well as large effusions, may uh, be responsible for extrusion of the body of the meniscus. But if you see extrusion of the body, you need to look very closely uh, and examine the posterior root ligament. Discoid menisci uh, is a term that refers to an abnormally shaped meniscus that resembles a disc more than a ring. They're much, much, much more common on the lateral side than they are in the medial side, although they do occur immediately. Um, diagnostically, you can um, find these if you see what looks like more than two bow ties on your sagittal images or meniscal tissue extending too far into the joint on your coronal images. Uh, there's a high association between discoid menisci and meniscal tears and meniscal cavitation. Uh, discoid menisci also tend to have variable morphology. There, there are many different types, um, which I'm not going to go into. But if you follow, like in this patient, let's count our bow ties. We have one, two, three, four, five, almost six. So we got five and a half uh, bow ties on this patient. It's a young patient, skeletally immature, but a definite discoid meniscus on this side. Here again, your coronal image, note there's too much meniscal tissue going too far into the joint. Again, discoid meniscus, this one has a small radial tear in it. If you see, as I said before, if you see extensive abnormal internal signal in a discoid meniscus, that corresponds to cavitation and liquefaction, and that should be interpreted as evidence of a tear even in the absence of extension of that signal to the surface of the meniscus. <clears throat> So this is, I think, kind of a neat finding. Um, it's a radiographic finding of a discoid meniscus. You can see this is a very unusual case because this is on the medial side. I've seen it before on the lateral side as well. Um, but on the medial side here, we can see there's a cupped appearance of the tibial plateau. It almost looks like there was an old tibial plateau fracture that is healed. That's not what it was. If we look here on the MR in the same patient, note the discoid meniscus here and here. There is a known association of this cupped appearance of the tibial plateau uh, and uh, with uh, discoid menisci. Here again, the tears in discoid menisci look uh, just the same as they do in every other meniscus. It's just important to remember that caveat about the extensive internal signal uh, corresponding to cavitation or liquefaction. A couple of words about parameniscal cysts. Um, I think most people know these are fluid-filled structures at the joint margin that virtually always have a connection with a meniscal tear. They're, the tears, the associated tears are usually horizontal, most commonly seen in men between the ages of 20 and 40. Medial um, cysts are more common than lateral cysts, okay, by MRI, on MRI. 
The orthopedic surgeons will tell you that lateral cysts are more common than medial cysts, and that's because they're easier to feel, I think, laterally. They're less soft tissue. There's less soft tissue laterally, and the lateral ones tend to be more symptomatic, but they're actually more common uh, medially. Remember that they can extend a long way from the joint. The underlying tear may be very subtle. Uh, here we have a very small tear of the uh, meniscus, but note this very large parameniscal cyst, which is extending all the way down here. Post contrast images, and note the uh, rim enhancement of this lesion. Sometimes these can be mistaken for tumors. Um, and I don't know if it was this case, I think it was, uh, it may have been this case that uh, they thought was a tumor, or maybe it's the next one. So I said they're, associ they're associated with medial and lateral meniscal tears with equal frequency. Medial cysts tend to be larger than the lateral cysts. Um, and the medial cysts are often posteriorly. The lateral cysts tend to be uh, adjacent to the uh, middle portion of the, uh, the lateral meniscus or adjacent to the anterior horn. Uh, cysts associated with the posterior horn of the medial meniscus may extend around the PCL. So if you see something that looks like a PCL ganglion, take a second look, look more closely and see if it's actually a parameniscal cyst that's coming around the PCL. Sometimes they erode bone. Um, radi on radiography, sometimes you can su suggest these if you see some erosion at the medial joint line of the tibia. <clears throat> It's important that the orthopedic surgeon treat both the tear and the cyst. If you just treat the cyst and don't treat the tear, the cyst will come back. All right. So here, I think actually this was the case that uh, there was some concern that there was a, uh, a mass or a tumor here. Here you can see a pretty obvious degenerative tear of the meniscus and then this very, very large parameniscal cyst that's extending down here adjacent to the tibia. So a typical appearance, not always this large, unfortunately, um, but a typical appearance of, uh, of uh, cyst. All right, a couple of words about meniscocapsular separation. I think this, caused, this diagnosis caused a, lot, caused a lot of anxiety, and I know it used to cause me a lot of anxiety, too. Um, remember that the posterior horn of the medial meniscus is the most common place you're going to see this. I showed you actually an example of a meniscocapsular separation on the lateral side when I show you, showed you the interruption of the struts or the fascicles around the popliteus tendon. That's what it looks like on the lateral side. You're not going to see that as often as you're going to see this. This is a case we had pretty recently, actually. This represents a separation of the meniscal attachments, from, of, usually of the medial meniscus, from the capsule. This leads to, leads to increased mobility of the meniscus. What you look for in imaging is fluid between the meniscus and the medial collateral ligament. You also look for an irregular meniscal outline, especially on the coronal images, and increased distance between the meniscus and the medial collateral ligament. Typically, um, you'll see most of the fluid posteriorly or in this area. It may extend up here. Usually does not involve the anterior portion. It usually involves the middle or mostly posterior portion of the meniscus. Here we see all this abnormal fluid back here between the meniscus and the capsule. Now remember I said before, I'm going to reiterate this, medial meniscus has a very tight attachment to the capsule. So the, this, all this fluid and edema is abnormal back here. Sometimes you may see a little bit of fluid that comes down here. That's a normal recess that occurs adjacent to the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. Here we're on the medial side. Sometimes a little bit of fluid coming right down there where I'm tracing with my um, arrow. That's okay. This amount of fluid is not okay. Remember I showed you uh, anatomically and schematically that very tight attachment here. We should not have edema and fluid back here. No edema and fluid should be extending back here. Up here a little fluid, okay. Back here, no way. That's meniscocapsular separation or injury. Um, that's what it looks like. So if you know exactly where to look for it and you know where the normal fluid should be and where it shouldn't be, I think it makes it a lot easier to diagnose these. I also said if you see abnormal fluid between the meniscus and the MCL, look relatively posteriorly. Don't look way up here because if you look too far anteriorly, you're going to get this confused with MCL bursitis, which I'm going to show you an example of a, a, little, a couple of slides. Um, MCL bursitis tends to occur up more anteriorly, but it's very, very nicely marginated, very smooth, well-defined. This is very poorly defined fluid and edema <clears throat> relatively posteriorly here between the meniscus and the, um, the medial ligaments here. This is not very well-defined. It's irregular. This is what meniscocapsular separation looks like. Look on your axial images. I think the axial images are quite useful for, for diagnosing this. Another example here, we're relatively, again, far posterior. Here you see the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. This is abnormal fluid between the medial meniscus and the uh, capsule here. 
capsule here. So menisco capsular separation. There should be no fluid in this area. Again, on the sagittal images, you see the same thing. Remember I said a little bit of fluid here is okay, but there should not be fluid extending all, all the way down there. I think this was probably associated with a paramenisco cyst as well. Again, axial images I think are very useful for looking for menisco capsular separation. It can be very subtle. Uh, a little bit of fluid here between the meniscus and the capsule. It should not have fluid there on the medial side, menisco capsular separation. The differential diagnosis, one of the most uh, difficult, uh, I think, things to distinguish it from can be MCL bursitis. Um, and the normal recess we talked about that are our peripheral longitudinal tears. You want to look very closely to see if you have a, uh, a meniscal tear associated with that. Um, here, this is an example of MCL bursitis. We're much more anterior now in the knee than we were before. See that this is a fluid that's relatively um, well circumscribed. There's not a lot of edema surrounding it. It's well marginated, nice and smooth between the MCL and the uh, medial meniscus. This is what MCL bursitis looks like. It tends to occur much more anteriorly. I'll have some uh, more words in the next lecture about MCL bursitis if we get to it. Okay, unstable tears versus stable tears. How do we decide whether a tear is stable? How does the orthopedic surgeon uh, decide whether a tear needs to go to the OR um, or not? Well, if there's a displaced meniscal fragment, that is an unstable tear. If you see the tear on more than two sagittal or three coronal slices, uh, that is a big or a long tear, that is also an unstable tear and needs to be uh, treated. Complex tears are also considered unstable. <clears throat> as well as the presence of more than one pattern of tear, such as contour irregularity, peripheral separation, tearing. Fluid in a tear automatically qualifies as an unstable tear. And then large radial tears are also considered unstable tears. So here we have what kind of tear? This is a flip meniscus, okay? Just like a, similar to the case I showed you before, unstable tear, displaced meniscal fragment, unstable. Tears that may be repaired are those that are traumatic, that occur in the vascular zone, either the red zone or the, or the pink zone. There's minimal involvement of the body segment. <clears throat> Peripheral longitudinal tears within five millimeters of the meniscocapsular junction, again, because they're occurring in the vascular zone, or uh, uh, tears that are relatively large. So this is an example of a, of a tear that might be repairable. It's a peripheral, vertical, traumatic type tear that occurs close to the meniscocapsular junction in the red zone of the meniscus. Here note the fluid in the tear. This is an unstable tear, so it does need to be treated. Non-repairable tears. Tears that are non-repairable are those that have moderate to severe, uh, demonstrate moderate to severe meniscal damage. Complete radial tears are non-repairable. Um, these have to be treated with a partial meniscectomy if they, if they can be. That's preferred over a total uh, meniscectomy um, because at least you're preserving some of the shock absorbing uh, ability of the menisci. <clears throat> Postoperative meniscus, what does it look like? If you preserve the outer one-third of the meniscus, then you have some positive effects on protecting the outer and middle portions of the involved car compartment. So basically, if you can preserve some of the meniscus, then you're going to preserve some of the shock-absorbing ability of that meniscus, and you're going to go in and hopefully preserve the articular cartilage in that compartment. If you take out, the more meniscus you take out, the more at risk you're going to be for going on and developing osteoarthritis in that compartment um, on down the line. So the, the goal is to preserve as much of the meniscal tissue as possible possible. Um, uh, one caveat is that some, there may be some partial regeneration of the meniscus after a, sub, uh, after a meniscectomy. Uh, we don't see a lot of that, but uh, what are the, postoperatively, what do the menisci look like? Contour irregularity is a normal finding, okay? This is an MRA. This is a normal MRA. The meniscus doesn't look normal. You can see it's small. It's truncated. It's somewhat a little bit irregular. That is a normal, that's fine. Persistent grade 3 signal, that is a normal finding as well. That's why it can be very difficult to diagnose recurrent, to, to diagnose meniscal tears after there's been a partial meniscectomy if there's not a joint effusion or you haven't done an arthrogram because persistent grade 3 signal, that is signal going to an articular surface, does not mean that you have a tear in the postoperative meniscus, okay? That may be a normal finding in the postoperative meniscus. <clears throat> Uh, you may have some normally, uh, some flattening of the femoral condyle as well after uh, partial meniscectomy. So here's what, again, a normal meniscus looks like. This is an uh, MR arthrogram. Here we can see just a small amount of meniscal tissue has been preserved, 
Uh, there's also been an ACL repair. Um, but there's no contrast going into the meniscus. What do we see in an at? What's the abnormal appearance? What do you look for? Well, if you're not doing an arthrogram and you've got uh, fluid in the joint, then you're okay because you've got uh, a joint effusion. If you see fluid going into the, into the meniscus, just like this, we've got fluid going into the meniscus, or you see a meniscal fragment, that's a no-brainer, then you've definitely got to re-tear unless they forgot for some reason to take it out or missed it. But um, fluid going into the meniscus is the best sign that you have a meniscal re-tear. Contrast on an MR arthrogram. Um, it's important to remember that most, if you see something that you think probably is a tear in a postoperative meniscus, there's surface irregularity or some abnormal signal going into it, there's a good chance that will be a tear because they usually tend to tr clean them up pretty well um, afterwards. And remember that you're, you've got a lot of force applied, um, a lot of these patients, to a very, uh, uh, just a very small remnant of a meniscus. So, so a, l a little bit of tissue is taking a lot of force and there is an increased instance that they're going, they're going to go on and develop a tear anyway. Um, and the other thing to look for in the postoperative meniscus is arthrofibrosis. Um, this is the cyclops lesion or focal arthrofibrosis. This may occur in the apse with only a uh, prior partial meniscectomy. It's reported predominantly in, a, in association with ACL tears. Well, with, I'm sorry, with uh, ACL after ACL repair. However, it may occur in the setting of just a uh, prior uh, meniscectomy. This patient had ACL uh, repair as well as a partial meniscectomy. Here you can see that globular fibrosis in the anterior portion of the joint, which is compatible with the focal arthrofibrosis. I'm just going to finish with a couple of words on the postoperative appearance here. This is an MR arthrogram. Here we see this abnormal contrast extending into the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. Again, compatible with a meniscal retear, your best evidence. Same thing here, MR arthrogram, abnormal signal going into the meniscus, compatible with a uh, re-tear of the meniscus. This is not a normal appearance. This is what a sonc lesion look lo looks like, to whoever asked that before. Um, again, thought now not to be osteonecrosis, but to be subchondral insufficiency fracture, flattening, sclerosis, and edema of the uh, medial femoral condyle. That's a known complication of arthroscopy. All right, thank you very much.